morning, church. Hey, real quick before we get started, uh, this month is what we call Global Priority Missions Month. There's a quick little uh, PowerPoint I want to point out to you this morning. So every November, we kind of set aside a few weeks. People save up all year for this just to think carefully about how we can invest our resources in supporting missionary families here and around the world. And the way we do that here is what we call Global Priority Missions Month. You should have received or see around the worship center a commitment card. It looks like this. Uh, And on the back, you'll see kind of where these gifts go. So just on the next slide here, let me just kind of walk through that quickly with you. Uh, When you, as you were led, commit to uh, giving this month and throughout the year, to Global Priority Missions, uh, here's a quick breakdown of where every dollar goes. So 5% goes to world hunger to help meet uh, physical needs, particular food needs around the world. Uh, 5% goes to mission partners in Indonesia. Uh, 20% goes to support uh, Tuscaloosa, TCBA, the local Baptist Association, and all of the kind of par- parachurch partner ministries that, th- that are under their umbrella. Uh, 5% goes toward Myers Mallory. That's our Alabama State, Alabama State Board of Missions offering. 25% goes to North America through the Annie Armstrong Easter offering. And then 40% goes internationally to support Lottie Moon and our IMB mission partners around the world. So every dollar that you feel led to give to support missions around the world, um, this is where it goes. So here's the plan. Just want to roll this out to you this week as the first week in November. And then our invitation is, would you consider uh, for the next two or three weeks how the Lord is leading you to give sacrificially over and, and above your regular tithes to uh, support this missions offering. Our goal this year is $22,000, and that's about what we took in uh, last year. We'd love to just crush that if we could, but that's our goal, $22,000. So this month, would you uh, consider how the Lord is leading you to commit to praying, uh, going, and giving to this missions offering? And then you can tell us how the Lord has led you to do that by filling out this commitment card and dropping it in the plate on your way out. We'd love for you uh, the last Sunday of this month, if you'll be here, to, to let that pencil that date on your calendar. That's the date we want to push all in. But if you won't be here, you want to give your offering before then, that's amazing. We want to be intentional about getting the gospel to the ends of the earth because that's really the one thing that Christ commanded us to do as he was headed to heaven. So, I'm going to pray for us real quick. I want to pray for this offering, pray that God will lead our church to be uh, open-handed in how we support missions, and then we'll look at this first week in our new series. Father, thank you so much for the good news of the gospel, that while we were yet sinners separated from you in our wickedness and our sin under your just right wrath, you, out of nothing but grace and mercy and love, sent your Son to die for us, that through his life and death on a cross and resurrection, we might be reconciled to you, be made right with you and know you and enjoy you and worship you forever. And it's because you're worthy of the worship of all of creation, like we just sung about, that we do missions because there are over 3 billion people in the world right now who are headed to an eternity apart from you. And a shocking number of those three billion have never even heard the name of Jesus. They don't even know that there is a way to be made right with you through Christ. And so we ask that you'd prick our hearts this month in particular as we focus our mind's attention and our heart's affection on how we can invest the resources you've generously blessed us with to pray, go, and give to support those who are laying down their lives in a very real sense to take the gospel to those who've never heard it. I pray for every man, woman, and child in this room that you might move us to commit boldly and sacrificially to going all in this month on making much of you, the God of the universe, by how we invest in this missions offering. We love you. We pray that this would be an overflow of our love for you as we marvel at your love for us 
in the gospel. We long for the day when the whole world will, will see the glory that you've allowed us to glimpse. And until that day, we want to be ferociously committed to taking the good news to the ends of the earth. It's for your beautiful name we ask all these things. Amen. In 1636, uh, there was a group of Puritans. They showed up in Cambridge, Massachusetts. That's kind of New England, Northeast area. And they started planting all these churches around New England. And and they quickly realized, "Uh, uh uh-oh, we want to start all these churches. But, man, we're looking around at the people in these cities, and we're not seeing a lot of guys who can pastor these churches. So we got a lot of guys in the bullpen but, but they're nowhere near ready to take the mound. So we gotta, we got to find a way to train up some new ministers who can shepherd all these churches we want to start in and around this area. So they, they establish a school with the motto, all for the glory of Christ. And they later changed that to truth for Christ and the church. That was their motto. That was their foundation. And a few years into their school, they made this pamphlet uh, called Rules and precepts, their kind of student handbook, and they gave it to every student, and here's what they said their core conviction was. The main end of a student's life and studies is to know God and Jesus Christ, which is eternal life, the only foundation of all sound knowledge and learning. Can you imagine if you saw that on UA's student handbook? Your mind would explode. So, for the first 100 years, man, they are just crushing it. They're, they're churning out well-trained, well-equipped, uh, well-seasoned pastors who can shape and mold these churches, who can lead them well. Some of those graduates would go on to lead some of the greatest revivals in the history of our country. In fact, almost half of the first graduating class went on to be pastors and ministers. And, and nine of their first 12 presidents were pastors and, and ministers. They are crushing it. Their, their foundation, their hope was all for the glory of Christ. And they're training men to do that, to lead these churches toward that end. But, but somewhere along the way, something happened. See, somewhere along the way, they began to drift. It started when they hired a president whose first move was to eliminate the requirement to take Christian classes from that school's curriculum. At one point, almost none of those graduates from that school were pastors and ministers. They would go on to eliminate Christ and the church from their motto, the truth for, the, for Christ and the church, just took those out and were left with this vague pursuit of truth, whatever that means. And, and maybe the culmination, the, the clearest example of their drift and becoming undocked from their love for the word and for the church came in 2005 when the school hired what they call a humanist chaplain, a man named Greg Epstein, who was a self-professing atheist wrote a book called Good Without God, and when asked by the New York Times, what is your philosophy? How are you going to reach these students at this school? What is your MO when it comes to spiritual leadership? Here's what he said. We don't look to a God for answers. We are each other's answers. (laughs) We don't look to God for answers. We are each other's answers. And this isn't some tiny podunk school on the backside of Seattle. This school, you might have heard of it, it's Harvard University. One of the most prestigious, sought-after schools on the, in the country at the very least. Now, as I read that little history of Harvard, I couldn't help but shake this question. How does that happen? How does a school that starts with all for the glory of Christ in just a couple hundred years hire a guy who's over all the prayer and spiritual leadership at the school whose claim to ministry philosophy is we don't need a God. 
We have each other. How do you start with all for Christ and the church and end up with something that is completely Christless and totally spiritually bankrupt? I don't know what you know about Harvard, but it's, they're not churning out pastors and ministers. In fact, it's one of the most, it's one of, let's forget it. Here's, here's how that happens. How does something go from being ferociously passionate about Christ and the gospel drift to becoming morally relative, spiritually bankrupt, totally powerless for the kingdom? And here's what you'll find with Harvard and Yale and Princeton, and the list goes on and on. It's very simple. It happens like this. By a slow, steady drift away from a passionate commitment to the word of God. If you were to put in a little chart an organization, institutions drift from biblical fidelity and spiritual power, you will find with it a trend line that exactly matches a total abandonment of the truth of God's word. And you may be saying, all right, Miss Harvard, though, I mean, they're crazy out there. What do they know? That could never happen. I mean, we expect that maybe from, from a state school or a liberal institution, but, but that wouldn't happen in the church. Would it? Let me read you Jeremiah chapter 5, where God says this. An appalling, horrible thing has taken place in the land. The prophets, the preachers, they prophesy falsely, and the priests rule by their own authority, and my people love it like this. And at the end of this chapter, Jeremiah sees judgment coming on the people of God because they had drifted away from their faithfulness to the scriptures, and they loved it. So if, if we, man, if we want to disconnect ourselves from spiritual power and become completely ineffective for the kingdom, it's a pretty simple formula. Let's just slowly drift away from the truth of God's word. But here's what I'll tell you. If we want to be ferociously kingdom-minded and make a, a, a difference for the kingdom that has ripple effects that go on through generation after generation, which is what we talked about last week, then it's going to start with the ferocious love and devotion for the word of God. If I could put it in a sentence, here's what I'd say. Our effectiveness as a church and our eternity as individuals is completely dependent on our faithfulness to God's word. That's it. Our effectiveness as a church, we want to walk in spiritual power. Our eternity as individuals, we want to be with Christ forever, is entirely dependent on our faithfulness and love and commitment to God's word. So that's, that's why we're, whether or not we're, the way I put it, people of the book. And that's what we call this series, People of the Book. And we're asking this question, which is my, my four-year-old's favorite question right now. When you hear why, when you hear our effectiveness as a church is dependent on our love and fidelity to the, to the Bible, the question you should ask is the same question my four-year-old asks all the time. You know what it is. Why? What is it about the book that would be so eternally significant that our faithfulness to God Almighty is dependent on our obedience to it. Like, wh why should we care at all about the scriptures? Why is it so important for the Bible to be central in our church? Specifically, why is it important for us to be people of the book when it comes to worship? So that really is the question we're kind of zooming in on for the next four weeks is, why is it important for us to be people of the book, particularly in our worship gathering, but, but as that worship gathering spills out into our everyday lives as believers? And, and, and what I'm talking about in particular here is preaching. And you might be going, man, why do, but why do we need a series on preaching? I mean, that's your job. Why, why, why do I care about preaching at all? That's what you're supposed to do. Let me give you a couple reasons. First, man, my heart for us is that we would be a church 
that can spot good, faithful, sound, biblical preaching and can spot a meaningless expounding on nothing. We can spot, man, that is preaching that points to the glory of Christ and that is just some oozy, fuzzy, spine-tingling nothing. But second, and here's, what, here's my, my greater burden, what you'll find is throughout the ch- history of the church, God always sparks renewal and ignites revival through faithfulness to his word. In particular, faithful preaching of his word. And if you're going, ah, I don't know about that, let me read you a quote from Martin Lloyd-Jones. I don't know if you've heard of him, one of the greatest preachers ever. But God did something incredible in his church in London in the 20th century, and here's what he said. Any study of church history, and particularly any study of the great periods of revival or awakening, demonstrates above everything else just this one fact, that the Christian church during all such periods has spoken with authority. Hear this sentence. The great characteristics of all revivals has been the authority of the preaching of God's word. There seemed to be something new and extra, and I love this, irresistible in what the preacher declared on behalf of God. And I don't know about you, but I want to be a part of a spiritual awakening, a spiritual renewal in my own heart, in this church, in our, in our culture, and, and what Lloyd Jones is saying is, man, I've just kind of watched the past 2,000 years, and those kind of things happen when we're tethered to the book. So if we want to be anchored in the book, we've got any shot at living out the values we've spent six weeks on the past couple of months, it's going to start with the word being central in our worship. But why does that matter? That's the question I want us to answer. Acts chapter 2 is going to help us. If you have your Bible, Acts chapter 2, we've been there for feels like 40 years, but it's really only been a few weeks. What I want to do actually is back up a little bit. So in the past six weeks, we looked at Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47, where we see the first, the first early church kind of making its mark on the, the history of the church, what they were devoted to. But I want to back up, actually, and over the next four weeks, we're going to look at verses 14 through 41. We're going to see what happened before the church got started, and here's what we'll find by looking to a sermon from the Apostle Peter. We're not going to read all 1,000 verses. We're just going to read, let's go the first eight or nine verses, verses 14 through 21. Here's what it says. Luke tells us this. Peter stood up with the 11, raised his voice, and proclaimed, that's some preaching here, proclaimed to them, fellow Jews and all you residents of Jerusalem, let this be known to you and pay attention to my words. For these people are not drunk. So, so the Holy Spirit had come down. People are speaking different languages. People think they're just drunk. And Peter says, no, 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 they're not drunk, as you think. It's only nine in the morning. It's too early to be popping the bottle. On the contrary, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. So he, he uses the Bible here, his, his scriptures. And it will be in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all people. Then your sons and your daughters will prophesy, your young men will see visions, and your old men will dream dreams. I will even pour out my spirit on my servants in those days, both men and women, and they will prophesy. I will display wonders in the heaven above and signs on the earth below. That's what we've been singing about this morning, blood and fire and a cloud of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and glorious day of the Lord comes. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Why is it important that we're people of the book? Why is it important that the word has to be central in our worship? I want to show you four reasons over the next four weeks. Here's the first one. Because the word is all we've got. Because the the word is all we've got. God, here's what I mean by that. Two things. First, I want to show you two things this morning. Here's the first one. Because the word is God's means of revelation. So if you're taking notes, that'll be on the screen. The word is God's means of revelation. See, all throughout scripture, God is revealing himself to his people through his word. Let me show you this. In 1 Samuel chapter 3, if you want to turn there, you can. 1 Samuel chapter 3. What happened in 1 Samuel chapter 3 
is you've got Samuel, who's kind of a, the apprentice of Eli, and the, the Lord comes to Samuel in a day that's pretty dark. In fact, look at the first verse of 1 Samuel 3, if you want to turn there with me. It says this, the boy Samuel served the Lord in Eli's presence. Hear this. In those days, the word of the Lord was rare. And prophetic visions, revelation, scripture, were not widespread. And yet look what happens at the end of the chapter. Samuel responds, the voice of the Lord. But listen to how the Bible describes how, how God shows up to Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 21. The Lord continued to appear in Shiloh because there he revealed himself to Samuel by his word. Even in, in a day when the word of the, God, of, of the Lord was rare, he is revealing himself how? Through his word. And you jump to the New Testament, there are a plethora of examples. Let me give you a few. We sang one in, from the Old Testament this morning, Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the skies proclaim his handiwork. Hebrews 11, 3 tells us that God created by his word. Mark 4, 39, Jesus speaks a word, and the seas are calm. Mark 1, Jesus speaks a word, and demons are cast out. Mark 2, Jesus speaks a word, and sins are forgiven by a, a word. Luke 18, Jesus speaks, and the blind see. Luke 7, incredible, Jesus speaks a word, and the dead are raised. Didn't call an ambulance. He just said, get up. Romans 10 says, when you put your faith in Christ for salvation, it comes by hearing the what? The word. So over and over again, the New Testament is trying to get us to, hey, listen, when God flexes his power, when he calms raging seas, when he gives sight to the blind, when he raises the dead, he does it through his word. You want, you want to see and walk in the power of God? It's going to come through his word. The word is how God reveals his power among his people. And man, we are fools if we think we can manufacture a move of God or the power of God in the church apart from the book. There, there's only one cable that connects to our church and our lives that gives us life and energy, and it's the word of God. Now, this is hard for us to get because, man, we don't live, here's, here's how we operate. If I want to reveal myself, want to show myself, want to, I want you to see me and hear me. What am I, I'm, I'm going to take a picture. I'm going to send a selfie. I'm going to call you on FaceTime. I'm going to Zoom call. I might even show up in person. That's how I show my, you want to hear me, see me, talk to me, encounter me, experience me. That, those are the, the methods I'm using. And yet one of the primary ways God uses to move and hear, for us to hear him speak and see him move and watch him work, is through the word. Because it's through the word that God primarily reveals himself to his people. Now, you might be thinking, okay, man, but what does all this have to do with worship? I mean, we're talking about revelation and God revealing himself through the word. What, who cares about that at all when it comes to worship? And here's what I'll tell you. Here's what we said a couple of weeks ago. Here's the answer to the question. What does this have to do with worship? We said a couple of weeks ago that worship is a rhythm of revelation and response. Worship is a rhythm of revelation and in response. So God reveals himself to us. How? Somebody help me out. How? Through the word. And, and then what do we do? That's the revelation. And what do we do? We respond. We respond by praying, by singing, by hearing the word preached and proclaimed, by giving, by, by coming alongside one another and praying, encouraging one another, by just gathering here. That's our response to the word. As we confess and repent of sin, we see marriages healed and hearts rest. All that is a response to the word, which is why when we, when we plan out our, our weekly gathering, we're not asking, man, what songs do we think people want to hear this week? That's just not the question. The question is, give me a passage. I need a passage. I need the word. So this week was Psalm 19, and we just walked through it chunk by chunk by chunk. We want to hear what God says. Hey, I'm, I'm the creator of the universe. The universe declares my glory. 
And that stirs up in us joy. So we're going to sing, man, praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. That's just plucked right out of the word. So, so when we gather for worship, our, our playbook is just the Bible. The question we're asking is not, is anybody like, like the music? We just, that's not the question. That is a silly question. The question is, was our worship a response to God's revelation as he's shown it to us in his word? That's our hope. That's our goal. That's our question. That's why the Bible has to be central in everything we do here when we gather. It has to be central when we leave this place. And here's the hard truth. If there is no revelation, if there is no word and worship, there is no worship. Because what are we responding to? Our emotions? Our feelings? No, no, no. God says, hey, worship is a, rev- is a rhythm of revelation response. Here's a revelation, and we're going to respond in all sorts of ways. But we're going to be people of the book when it comes to worship, because the word is God's primary means of revelation. You want to see God move and speak and restore and heal and mend and encourage and rebuke and convict. He's already done it. People say, well, I, I just don't, I just can't get a word from the Lord. I, God doesn't speak to me. I just haven't heard from him. Well, have you cracked open the book? It's right here. It's right here. Just come and see. Here's the second reason that we want to be people of the book. The word is God's primary means of revelation. And the word is our source of proclamation. The word is God's means of revelation. It's how he shows himself to us, through, through the word primarily. And second, we want to be people of the book because the, the, the book is our source of proclamation. Let me show you this in Acts chapter 2. Come back to Acts chapter 2. Notice how Peter starts his sermon in verse 14. Here's what he says. Peter stood up with the eleven. He raised his voice and he proclaimed to them. And then, he, then he goes on. That word proclaimed literally means to speak seriously, to speak with gravity, to speak with weight, to speak in such a way that you couldn't, you could have heard a pin drop. Because all eyes are fixed on Peter, all ears are tuned into Peter, he's speaking with the kind of seriousness and gravity. So he doesn't stand up and tell some jokes. He doesn't start his deal with a a, a funny little quip. He's not giving a TED talk. He stands up and proclaims the word of God with seriousness, with gravity, because he knows it's all he's got. And you'll notice the whole sermon is just references from, from from his scriptures, from the word. And so Peter's sermon teaches two things really. First is this. When it comes to the proclamation of God's word, here's the first thing Peter's sermon tells us is the responsibility of every preacher, pastor, teacher who who proclaims to herald this book. First is this. The primary responsibility of the preacher, teacher, proclaimer is to expose the voice of God. So over and over again, Peter is pulling out passage from the Old Testament. God has spoken, and his responsibility is to expose it, to explain it, to reveal it to the people. So, so sometimes you'll hear this called expository preaching. Not, not suppository preaching, expository preaching. Just exposing what's in the text. But the second thing Peter does here is this. He doesn't just expose or show or explain what God is saying through his word. He actually points people to God's greatness. He exalts the greatness of God over and over again. Let me show you some verses. Write them down. We don't have time to read them. But verse 17, he says, God's going to pour out his spirit. Verse 22, God is doing miracles, wonders, and signs. Verse 23, God delivered up Jesus that you might be saved. Verse 24, God raised Jesus from the dead so that we might conquer, be part of, co-heirs with, the one who's conquered sin, death, and Satan. Verse 30, God knew that he would send Jesus to the cross from long before, and he made a way when there was no way. Verse 32, God has raised Jesus, and we witness this. Verse 36, therefore let all the house of Israel know with certainty that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and, and, and Messiah. 
So over and over and over and over again, Peter's saying, I'm not the point, but I want to decrease so that, that Jesus might increase so that when you hear the word proclaim, you leave thinking with a, a better vision, a clearer glimpse of how glorious and majestic and great God is. Like that's our goal every week with what we sing and teach and pray. We want to make much of Jesus that our eyes might get up high enough to get a glimpse of God's glory. And that should be the goal. That should be your expectation of every message, sermon, teaching you hear proclaimed from the book is, does this expose what God has said faithfully, but more than that maybe, does it exalt the greatness of God? My job week in and week out is not to make you laugh or make you feel good or give you warm fuzzies. I hope all that happens in some way. But my responsibility before God Almighty is to open up the book and as best I can with all, me or whoever's preaching, the best we can with all the grace God will give us, say, look how good God is. Look at his mercy. Look at his grace. Look at his kindness. Look at his, whole, look at his love. How can we not worship a God like this? And if you don't leave asking that question, then, then you should ask, was, was anything preached that morning? Was anything proclaimed faithfully that morning? And here's what's amazing. I don't have to think about this or, or debate about this or Google this. Or, I'm, not, I'm not worried or stressed about what am I going to say next week. I, I don't worry about that. It's right here. I just got to open the book. So in a few weeks, our family's going to go to uh, my favorite place, the mountains. I'm a mountains guy. Anybody a mountains person? Anybody, any beachers? Man, so sorry. You're missing out on the mountains. Mountains, my jam. We're going to go to... Cades Cove and all, all the fun things you do in Tennessee. And one of my favorite parts is when we go to Cades Cove, you got to drive up, up and you, almost like, I don't know how there's a road there. They just kind of cut it through some rocks and it's, there's trees and there's some snow and, and it's just, it's just, it just does something in my soul. Here, here's what I love about the mountains. I don't, ha I don't have to be convinced or convince our kids that, man, these mountains are great. They are, they're awesome. They just do something in you. I don't have to convince them of that. I just put them in the car, and we drive around, and they see it. That's it. That, that's all I am responsible for every week is say, man, I don't have to make this up. Just look. It's right here. Look how amazing and majestic and great God is. I'm not the chef here. I don't cook this stuff, and you should be glad about that. Ask my wife. You don't want me cooking anything. I don't cook. My job is just to get it to the table, and I want to get it hot. I want you to leave. I want all of us to leave with a greater affection and love for the God who saved us and redeemed us and rescued us and can heal us and restore us. And so I'm not agonizing about what to preach any more than Peter is. Man, he's just pulling from the Psalms and Isaiah and Joel saying, no, look at God. Look at how great and majestic and glorious and awesome God is. So all I want to do, man, is open the book every week and just... Help you to see the God that saved you and redeemed you and called you by name and is worthy of the worship of every star and every galaxy and every universe and who condescended despite that to save you and me. I want to get, get us there every week. And I hear some preachers, preaching gurus say things, just keep it light, man. People are stressed enough, just keep it funny, keep it humorous, keep it to about 20 minutes. Don't get, don't meddle, don't pontificate, don't act like you, you got it all together and here's a, don't, don't tell people what to do, just kind of keep it fluffy, don't be offensive, don't be, and, and I think I understand what they're saying, but man, at some point I just want to say, are you, are you kidding me right now? Keep it light? And funny? Tell some jokes? And here's why that provokes me, because here's what I know. I know there are people in this room right now whose marriages are hanging on by a thread. Who, there, there are 
spouses who feel all alone, despite having been married for years, who feel emotionally disconnected from their husband or wife, who are just one argument away from a divorce. I know in this room there are moms who are carrying the spiritual load for their families and are standing in the gap for their husbands. And if they were honest, they're hurting and they're exhausted and they feel like they have nowhere to turn. And they're praying their guts out that God might shake their husband into obedience and godliness. And we're praying that with them. But right now it's not happening. I know we've got grandparents in this room who are doing all they can to raise grandkids because of parents who have gone on to be with the Lord or parents who are trying to find their feet again. Grandparents who are find themselves trying to raise their grandkids in a godly way, all the while trying to love and support their own kids as best they know how. College students, high school students, business students from all grades who are just being pounded at school, on social media, who can't seem to figure out who in the world they are. And they want to live in a godly way, but they go to school and they hear their teachers and they watch the news and they scroll TikTok. And they're being pulled in every single direction, every single day. And they want to be all in on, on Jesus, but just seems so goofy and silly. And they're confused and frustrated. Don't know where to go. I mean, I know there are men and women, sons and daughters, parents, grandparents in this room right now who have an appointment this week or next for yet another prognosis that it's come back and it's more serious and it's more painful and it might it might be the last diagnosis you get, and there's cancer and debilitating disease. People whose family members are just, their body is failing them on every level, and we're trying to figure out how do we support and love and encourage, all the while having your gut stripped out, watching somebody's, somebody you love's body waste away right in front of you, can't do anything about it. All that is in this room. I'm supposed to be funny? I'm supposed to tell a joke? Are you, you don't need jokes. You don't need funny. You need the word. You need God to restore you and heal you and mend you and strengthen you and calm you and give you peace and hope and life and joy. And he has. So I don't feel any need to be funny up here. Not tell, this, we're not playing games. This is real life and death stuff that you and I are walking through. And this is the primary source of Anything that would give you hope and life and joy. Because here's what I know. 2 Corinthians 4 tells us this. That there's a God of this age, Satan, who is blinding the minds of unbelievers. That's verse 4. Verse 6 says, the true God is shining light into the hearts of those who put their faith in Jesus. So God of this age, Satan, is trying to blind our minds and blunt our affections. God of this age, God, true God, God Almighty, is trying to shine light into our hearts and give us eyes to see. And verse 5, right in the middle, what does he say? He says, we preach Christ. So how in the world do we get to the light? How do we get to hope and joy and the God of the universe? It comes through faithful proclamation of God's word. Now do you see why, why this is all we've got? And it's all we want. We don't, we don't want what Fox says. We don't want what Facebook says. We don't want what your favorite Instagram influencer or TikToker says. We don't want anything else but this word. We want to be people of the book. Because it's all we've got, church. And any other foundation is a foundation built on sinking sand. So here's my challenge for us as we ask this question. How, how do we make the word central in our lives so that when we show up to our worship gathering, that's all we want. We don't want to hear anything else but, but the scriptures. Don't want jokes. It's fine if you can tell them. Don't want cool fun. We just... Get us to the Bible. We want to be people of the book. Let me just give you one challenge. Our favorite, our, my, my daughter's favorite game right now is hide and go seek, hide and seek. I love, I love listening to them play because our four-year-old hasn't figured out how the game works yet, but she wants to play with her sister. So I say, hey, sister, count to 10. I'm going to go hide. So one, two, three. And she runs into the kitchen and gets behind the, the little pantry and like hides in there. And then as, as my oldest daughter gets to closer to 10, she says, eight, nine. She's like, ah, 
Don't, don't, don't find me, sissy. I'm in the kitchen. <laughs> they want to play hide and seek so bad. I, I want to give you the opposite challenge. Let's seek and hide. Let's seek the word and hide it in our hearts. See, Jesus gives us incredible promise in Matthew 7. He says, Man, would you ask? Would you seek? Would you knock? That's some stuff that we got to do. But here's what the promise is. Ask and what? It will be given to you. Seek and what? You're going to find it. Would you knock? And the one, the one who knocks the door will be open. Did you hear that promise? We don't have to wait for God to hear us when we seek him. We don't have to wonder if he's here when we gather. He's told us from the book that he is. So we just want to seek it with all we've got. Let me give you a couple ways you can do that. First, very practically, in your own life. I mean, I, I, don't, I talk to so many believers who feel stunted in their spiritual growth. And when I ask them, tell me about your time in the word. They just look back at me like I just popped out an extra head. Like they have no category for, well, man, maybe the reason I'm not growing closer to the Lord is because we're just not communicating. I've just disconnected my soul from the power source. Well, then it's no wonder that you feel dry and stunted and dead. Would you seek it? Would you set aside a time, five minutes this week? Just start here. Set aside a time. Maybe it's morning. Maybe it's nine. Set aside a place, wherever, wherever a quiet, calm place is for you. Pick a book, pick a passage, pick a verse, and just read it and ask this one question. God, what do you have to say to me this morning? What are you telling me tonight? That's it. Seek. And here's what you'll find. Psalm tells us, man, there's, there's this incredible reality that once you taste a little bit of the sweetness of the scriptures, then, then you begin to crave it more and more. That's why the psalm says, would you taste and see that the Lord is good? I mean, man, here's, here's the, the offer on the table is a medium rare filet. But some of us are settling for a dollar cheeseburger. You hadn't tasted the goodness, but you can ask, seek, and knock. So, so individually, find, set aside, make space for a time and a place. Pick, pick a passage, verse, book, read it, and ask one question. God, how, what are you saying to me in this passage right now? That's it. And he's promised he'll show you. He'll speak. He already has. He wants to meet you. And then corporately, here's a couple ways you can help us make the book central in our worship because it's all we've got. When you come to worship, would you bring your Bible? I know that sounds insane, but, but we, we can't really get in the book if you don't bring a book. So, so phone or, or paper, whatever your jam is, would you, would you bring it? And then would you follow along as we're reading through the path? We, that's not witchcraft, not like God loves you more if you bring your Bible. It's no, we can't, it, it communicates, I'm expecting God to move here. I'm excited to see what God's going to do in our gathering this morning when we open up the book. So open it, mark it, and bring it. Expect God to speak through you. We're going to celebrate it and pray it and sing it. So, man, you want, you want to make an di immediate difference in our gathering? Would you sing your guts out? Because we're just singing the Bible. That's all we're singing. We're just singing how good and great and glorious and kind and gracious and merciful God is. That's all we're doing. We're just singing the Bible, and he's promised that when we see. We'll find. If we'll just knock, the door will be open. We want to be people of the book because it's all we got. Because our effectiveness as a church and our eternity as individuals is dependent on our faithfulness to the book. We want to be people of the book because it's all we've got and it's all we want. God help us. Help us to have a deeper longing and thirst for your word. We just confess it so often. We, 
get distracted, lose focus, start tasting and seeing lesser pleasures and soon find ourselves disinterested and communing with you, sitting at your feet and experiencing your presence as you've revealed yourself to us through your word. And we just stand in awe that you would you would see fit to reveal yourself to us at all. We ask that we would take seriously how you've revealed yourself to us through your word. We ask that we would be people of the book who love your word, who worship the God of the Bible, who gave it to us, revealed himself through it, and who has promised to use it to change and and renew and heal and restore us. So we want to be people who are excited about singing it, about praying it, about celebrating it, about reading it, about hiding it in our heart. We want it to be the food that our soul depends on, and we pray that you would, over time, cultivate in our hearts a, a greater, more sensitive taste for the things of the book and a greater disdain and hatred of the things that aren't. And I pray that those in this room or online who don't know you, who haven't put their faith in you, they've heard the word, but they haven't responded by putting their faith in you, by putting their trust in your life, death, and resurrection, that they might come out from under the wrath of God and that they might be made right with the God who loves them. I pray that they would make that step today, that they would respond by simply praying, God, I I want to know this God that we're singing about, who reigns over the universe and who sent his son to die for me. And I, I confess that I need you. I confess that I'm a sinner. And I pray that you would save me from my sins and set me right with you. And, and he's promised to do that. I'm praying that prayer over men and women and children in this room right now. God, do it. You promise in your word you will, and we're asking that you will. Help us be people of the book because it's all we've got and it's all we want. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Thank you.